Thank you for tuning into Growing Tech Fast, the condensed podcast in which conversations about growing SaaS startups are had with those who have grown them. Now, today I am joined by Jaron Vosberg, who is VP of Sales over at Jump Crew. Jaron, thank you so much for joining us and for agreeing to be a guest. Yeah, it's my pleasure, Connor. Thanks for having me. No worries. Well, cool. Well, where we always start, Jaron, is essentially giving our guests the opportunity to tell us a bit more about themselves and their background. So I know you've got an interesting story as to how you ended up at Jump Crew. So if you want to give us a quick high-level overview of, uh, of what led you to be where you're at today, that would be, be a great start. Sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to. It's definitely been a little bit of a roundabout journey to get here, but I'll try to summarize it as quickly as I can. Um, but I grew up in a small town in East Tennessee called Oak Ridge, about 20,000 people. And as soon as I turned 18, like most 18 year olds, I wanted to get about as far away from my hometown as I possibly could. So geographically, I did that. I went to Los Angeles um, and I studied film production at Loyola Marymount University. I really wanted to be a director. And I loved film. Um, it was a fantastic major, had an up and coming program. And then when I graduated, I had the opportunity to work on the production side. I worked at a music video production company as an assistant and as a coordinator and uh, helped more so on the actual shooting, editing and producing of music videos. And it was around that time where I had gotten really obsessed with this idea from Entourage. There's a character on that show, if you're familiar with it, Ari Gold, um, who had like two cell phones, super agent, you know, driving a Beamer. And I was like, man, I feel like if I'm going to make it in this entertainment business. I got to see the other side of things and become Ari Gold. So I started shopping around to see if I could make my way into one of the agencies. And in Los Angeles, it is as competitive as it gets. Um, the big agencies, the creative artists, the William Morris's of the world typically have a line a mile long with people chomping up a bit to get in there. Um, so that actually worked in my favor in a way because I ended up at a, a very small but influential talent agency called Special Artists Agency. Um, and the CEO of that company had been working on that business since the 70s. And it was a really unique intersection where they would pair talent with brands. So if you see a billboard with Leonardo DiCaprio wearing a tag hewer watch, those are the types of deals that we would broker. And so I had the opportunity to work as her direct assistant. And it was probably the most transformative job of my entire career until Jump Crew in that it was suit and tie every single day, first thing in the morning until literally seven o'clock at night. Like we worked all day. Um, I was her right hand man, if you will. I had the opportunity to see her navigating brokering deals of all different types, uh, mostly with brands that everybody knows, with talent that most people know or that's up and coming. And our office was in Beverly Hills. It was like a dream come true for a small town kid to, to get to live in that world and you know spend time with talent, spend time working on deals. Um, and I learned a lot from that experience that I've seen translate uh, into my day to day now um, in terms of attention to detail, um, precision in terms of decision making and quality of work, um, promptness, like early is on time, on time is late, um, communication, like it, I still have a good relationship with the CEO there who um, I actually just spoke to her yesterday and mentioned to her like, I, it, you're your uh, your leadership has echoed in my life even till today um, but it was around that time that i met my now wife and we were thinking about making a change we ended up moving to denver and uh, i ended up at a company that was very quickly acquired by ancestry.com um, which really introduced me to the tech world and so i started to get bit by that technology bug and started going to startup events and get an idea of what i really dug out there um, and uh, there was actually a time between those two where I had tried starting my own company. It was a fitness and music startup and we actually took a product to market and had paying users. We ended up sunsetting the project because a, a competitor with a lot of funding came out and we were bootstrapping the whole thing and I just couldn't afford it anymore. So um, we sunsetted that and then ultimately made our way to Nashville four years ago as just another kind of jump, try something new. My wife got a job. I hunted for jobs for a while. I ultimately ended up landing at Jump Crew as an account executive. And um, that was four years ago. And I've been here ever since. Fantastic. Well, what um, probably a unique story, I imagine, uh, both geographically, background wise as well. But it sounds as if like a lot of that has helped translated into the work you're doing today as well, which I think is always 
a nice a nice lesson that you can learn so much from all your experiences um, that that have gone before where you're at today. So you joined Jump Crew as an AE four years fast forward four years um your vp sales um jump crew has grown tremendously i can't remember what size you said jump crew were when you joined but i know now you're north of 300 right so you've gone through this enormous hyper growth phase talk to me like how has that been that accelerated um career progression um, hiring exploding around you just talked about like how how those last four years have been and like did you predict that that was what was going to happen or was it a real like toe in the water when you first joined yeah i certainly couldn't have predicted it at least at this scale but my biggest priority when i was looking for a job in nashville was somewhere where i could get in on the ground floor have an impact um, somewhere that had a lot of potential upside. And I had never stayed at a job for more than two years. And I was like, I'm 27 at the time. Like I can't risk more career pivots. I really need to just find a lane and stick to it. And um, my current boss, uh, who's our SVP of partnerships has been my boss since day one and really sold me on the vision of what jump crew could be our CEO. Um, Robert Henderson really sold me on the vision of what jump crew could be. And so I was totally bought in from day one. And I think what I've learned is, you know, you've got to be really comfortable with change and you have to be really comfortable with the idea that you're building something every day. Um, there are certainly roles out there where it's more predictable, where if you follow a pretty concrete step-by-step -step process, then you have a decent shot at being successful. Um, when you're at a startup, especially one that's growing as quickly as Jump Crew has, there's rarely a playbook, or if there is, that playbook is going to change probably within a couple of weeks. Um, and so being comfortable with that and then being bought in on this mentality that like every day is a small building block towards something bigger and we're never going to have it perfect. And that takes some stomach. It takes a little bit of guts. Um, and honestly, it takes um, a little bit of um, risk as an individual to do that. But when you find the right people who are bought in on that vision, it certainly helps. And I think one of my biggest takeaways looking back on Jump Crew is that it starts with people, man. It's like it, it, you got to find people who are bought in on your set of values, who are bought in on the vision um, that aren't transactional employees. It's inevitable when you're growing quickly, people just need a job um, and that's perfectly fine. But the more work you can do on the front end to find people who are really committed to executing that vision and know that there's going to be a lot of unpredictability, like that cascades throughout the organization. And you find that those are the people who elevate really quickly. And I've seen that, like my story is not that unique at Jump Crew. I mean, there is a great deal of people here who have started in entry level roles and have moved into leadership positions very quickly because we're creating a need every single day. There weren't crystallized career trajectories. In fact, when I started Jump Crew, we sold a completely different product than we sold, sell now. And so as we brought in more and more business, as we pivoted, what we do, it creates new roles. Like my first sales manager job didn't exist before I took it on. My first director job was in a department that didn't exist before I took it on. And so that's, um, you know, there's pros and cons of that for a lot of people. But I think that if you find the right people, then you're able to evolve quickly um, with agility and you can stay the course for uh, what the organization is focused on. Fantastic. Cool. Well, look, that's um, <clears throat> really inside trying I think like some of the stuff you mentioned that really um, resonates. I think you said about embracing change. I think that's, you know, the heart of any person who's going to be successful as a startup employee has to embrace change. <laughs> I think there was a, an English intellectual that I uh, liked and we studied it at my university. Um, and he used to say to live is to change. To change often is to be perfect. <laughs> and it was the idea that change is actually at the heart of everything we do in order to like give life to new initiatives to keep to keep growing essentially so i think that that's really important and uh, you also spoke about people i think again that's always the big question is how do we find the best talent and those who are bought into the vision i think like that as soon as you said you, you it's, it's how do you get that balance between acceptance they're always going to be um some functional employees as you put it and then the real engine if you like of growth is going to be those who really buy into the bigger picture and the idea that you are actually building something day day after day week after week so 
I love I love all of that. I guess that there's so many things you've drawn on there. There's uh, buying into the vision. There's embracing change. Um, there's people. Um, so a quick question from me, and I don't know if it'll be something you've already mentioned or maybe something new, but um, if you could like designate or diagnose, should I say, Jump Crew's um, success in terms of their growth over the last few years, um, like what would it be? Like what do you think is the one thing if you could say like this has been the most important the most transformational thing that's allowed us to have that you know kind of cadence of uh of consistent growth is there anything you could put your finger on yeah it's definitely a combination of things but the first thing that came to mind for me was understanding what your customers really need um i think that one of the most important pivots that we made as an organization is that when i started we were actually selling social media for SMBs, mid-market companies, we would create all of their content, we would manage the reporting, we would make recommendations on how to better engage their audience, increase their overall brand awareness. And there's a ton of value to that as part of a holistic marketing approach. But at the end of the day, what we started to identify was that all of those efforts around awareness are really there to ultimately drive top of funnel to the outcome everybody needs, which is revenue. Everybody needs dollars coming in the door. And interestingly enough, like whether you're a new company that's going to market for the first time, whether you're a company that's been around for a little while and feel like there's ways in which you can do things better, or you're a large organization that's looking to capitalize on a new opportunity, the end goal is always the same. And what didn't really exist years ago was a scalable turnkey infrastructure for being able to create that revenue and the opportunity that we identified was that hey you know we're a sales organization like we sell what jump crew does day in and day out using data using process using personnel using experience using leadership that's something we could potentially leverage for current clients and new clients because that's what they need um, and so being agile enough, that seems to be a theme that we're, hmm. that we're hitting on here. It's really key being agile to recognize that and, you know, not being so, um, set in your ways that ah, this is our product. This is what we're going to do. Like the market's constantly evolving. The needs of your customers are constantly evolving. Um, I think that that ability to recognize that just through conversation, you know, a, a exp exploration is key and then being able to build products around it. Um, something else that I'll certainly give our team a ton of credit for is process is key, even if it's only going to last for a little while. And so that alignment between sales and marketing, which is historically one of the most challenging alignments to accomplish, is critical, not just in us supporting our clients, but also internally. Like We have to be able to align what my sales team is selling with how we position it on the marketing side. And when we made that fundamental shift, like that took time to really codify how we were going to present what Jump Crew does, how we were going to sell what Jump Crew does, and then on the back end, how we were actually going to deliver it. And so I'd even add one more department, at least from Jump Crew's perspective, which is the delivery side, the team's responsible for actually doing what we said we were going to do, getting that three-headed monster of sales, marketing, and delivery totally aligned, I think really has been instrumental in the success that we've seen as we've continued to grow just in size when process gets harder and harder. And then also as we've pivoted based on what the market really wants. Cool. Fantastic. Well, there's loads of stuff you've covered off there, um, Jaron, but I think as you reference yourself, there's something we keep coming back to, which is around this need to be to be agile, right? To be flexible. Um, but also something you discussed was actually still needing to make sure you stick to the process, even if that process is there for a short time, right? So I guess what I'm really interested in is this um, kind of how you hold in, in balance and in the right balance, the, the need to be systematic and to have a process um, so that it's not chaos, right? But also to, to keep in, in, in shape that there's enough agility and flexibility so that there's innovation. So just talk to me like around that, like how has that been and, and, and how do you best strike that balance between being agile but also sticking to a process? 
Yeah, it's very, it's difficult. Um, and <laughs> it's even harder as the organization gets bigger because, you know, it's easy enough for me to send an email or send a Slack or have a phone conversation with somebody and we can both agree that that's how something's going to work, but it's different for it to become something that we can repeat. And that's what becomes challenging when you bring new people into the organization, you know, you, you have to have something for them to start with that everyone agrees upon this is the way in which we're going to do these things. And so you really have to rely a little bit more on technology. Um, this is a little bit different for everybody, but for us, you know, we use Salesforce, um, figuring out how we can all lean into leveraging one source of truth. And then what are the dovetails out of that source of truth that every decision maker or every stakeholder and every respective department has to own their small piece of that puzzle for our purposes it starts from the marketing side. When a lead is created, that lead is now living in our CRM. My team works that lead and that entire life cycle is tracked and managed through our CRM up until the point at which a contract is signed. When a contract is signed, that has to trigger a waterfall of notifications and tasks for other respective departments. And then as you create systematic process around what can be sometimes an ambiguous or fluid life cycle of a new customer, then you can better identify where the leakage is in that process and also use just the objectivity of data to tell you where the pitfalls are and where you can make tweaks. Because I love people. People are what ultimately make a great organization, but people are qualitative. It's ambiguous. It's fluid. It's gray area. There's a lot of nuance to it. Code is code. It's ones and zeros. And so as much as you can leverage the technology that's available, the better that you can find a way to systematize a process that could otherwise be unpredictable. Fantastic. Yeah, I love that. Data, the data doesn't lie, right? <laughs> so right. the need to, to make informed decisions based on data, um, hold it, yeah, and, and, and helping that develop develop processes and change. Um, so just while we're talking about change and the need to be agile, just coming in from like a slightly different angle now, Jeremy, because this is obviously very topical uh, for anyone and everyone who's who's going to be listening here, which is around the transition, right, to, to remote work and how that has been thrust upon organizations. And I, I know from uh, Jump Crew's perspective, I think it's just right to say you were formerly a kind of brick and water organization, right? And obviously that was no longer tenable during COVID. So just talk to you about like how that transition has been going from fully office-based to fully remote. Like, yeah, just talk to you a bit around that, that journey. Yeah, I mean, we certainly um, had to evolve like everybody did. But interestingly enough, um, in November of 2019, um, Robert, our CEO, Rob Solberg, our SVP of partnerships, and myself had sat down and talked a little bit about what Jump Crew could look like if we became more of a distributed workforce. You're right. You know, we had been predominantly brick and mortar, um, which uh, was a model that was our just standard um, really since day one. But the idea was, could we broaden our access to the best sales talent in the country by creating an option for remote work? You know, our business is so heavily reliant upon finding great sales talent that if we can expand our total addressable market of that talent, that would have significant benefits for us and for our clients. And so we actually started to build out a model for how would we find remote work? How would we find remote workers? How would we onboard remote workers? How would we manage their um, cultural investment in Jump Crew, which can be very tricky, especially with remote work, having that identity of I'm part of Jump Crew, although I'm sitting here in my living room wearing a button up board shorts, probably. Um, and so we had started working on that plan and actually put that plan into motion at the beginning of 2020. And so we were standing up these systems, tools, process, and new personnel to help manage that already. COVID hits really end of February and in March, and not much changed for us as an organization other than everybody starting to work from home where that necessity 
for those systems and process and personnel became even that much more important. And then during the course of 2020, it gave us an opportunity to fail really quickly to understand what was working, what wasn't. Um, and then even now today, a lot of those processes that we developed in a fully distributed work environment still hold true in what I call our hybrid distributed work environment in which we have a brand new office here in Nashville. We have 60,000 square feet. Um, we have probably, you know, 65 to a hundred people in here on any given day. And then the rest of the organization is remote. And so you'll see that the fruits of that labor from 2020 have paid off. We certainly don't have it perfected as I'm sure very few people actually do. We're still learning, but having t done that work in advance, we found is, uh, has been so influential in us being able to manage that transition from, you know, COVID is state of the world to now trying to find some semblance of that hybrid brick and mortar and, uh, and remote work environment. But it's still a work in progress. And I think it probably always will be. Yeah, no, I get that, and I think it's um, it's interesting. I see it seems to have stemmed from an, um, an awareness from from yourself and from the senior leadership team that getting the best people is what's most important and what matters most. Essentially, um, I think that's really really cool. And I think a lot of companies are now being forced to see that as a result of COVID. Obviously, you were doing that preemptively, <clears throat> but um, just like we're coming up towards like the end of our time. Jaron, but just um, one final question, just whilst we're talking about the remote thing, I know that I said a lot of people who are, um, are listening um, often ask around leadership and how that has changed remotely. So if you could just give like one or two quick top tips to those who for the first time are trying to run, you know, remote sales team successfully, like anything you've learned from your experience over the last, you know, year, year and a half or so that you would share that's helped, helped you be successful. Yeah, absolutely. I'd, I'd say early on in our fully remote work environment, I found myself to a fault being a little bit more micromanagey. Like, I don't know what people are doing, especially when I'm recruiting, hiring them, and then onboarding them fully remote. Like, we leave a meeting and I'm just keeping my fingers crossed and <laughs> hoping that they're working. So, I think some of the biggest takeaways I took from that is it's absolutely critical to have some type of accountable training curriculum in place in advance. And when I say accountable, it's not, Hey, just take a look at this Google drive and get acquainted with this. You know, I, I hate to even go back to this world, but I mean, like quizzes, tests, I, I'm not a huge fan of those, but making sure that there is a structure in place where you understand what that individual should be able to understand. And then you're building some type of learning and development program around that so that there can be some accountability. I've covered this check mark. I have an understanding of this check mark. Okay, let's revisit this check mark. And if they're doing independent study, having some framework of accountability around that. Um, and then the other is trying not to over meeting schedule. I felt that I was doing that a lot early on. Like if they're in a meeting with me, then I know they're actually working. I can actually find that to be counterproductive. So I would prefer to lean into a task accomplishment or KPI attainment as a way in which to measure performance. And as a sales organization, really understanding KPIs and having an operational motion in place where you can track those KPIs, I'd say is probably even more important. Um, you know, I, I was told this by our CEO and I've, I've definitely echoed this as well as there's really three main facets to, you know, a sales role. One is closed deals, one is opportunities, and then next is activities. If you're closing deals, I don't care much about opportunities and activities. If you're closing a deal or two and you've got a lot of ops, I don't really care that much about your opportunities, but every, or excuse me, your activities, but everything starts with activities. So making sure that you understand where your activities dashboard is gonna be, that your expectations for your team are very clearly communicated. And then to your point, Connor, the objectivity of the data doesn't lie. There is no, question what someone is or isn't doing if they're hitting their mark in those three key categories and that's being tracked and measured in a singular source of truth. So I think that's critical. So training that's accountable, systematized and intentional, and then also having a framework for establishing, tracking and encouraging the attainment of KPIs. I love that. I love that. Accountability, 100% accountability. Don't overschedule meetings as well. <laughs> I have something really... 
everyone did at the start of COVID. Was, I certainly did as well with my team. So look, I know we've uh, run out of time here, but thank you so much, Jaren, for coming on, sharing all of your um, insights and experiences with, uh, with us, uh, with our listeners. It's been fantastic uh, to be able to speak to you today. So thank you once again for agreeing to be a part of this. Thank you, Connor. It's been awesome, man. Thank you. Cheers, Jaren. Thanks, everyone. And until next time, goodbye.